making the not so obvious obvious. This video is part of Shut Up and Shoot, that famous ebook, you know, the one you should be getting now. All right, so now we have a piece of footage here, and uh, I am all set. I've got my 1920 by 1080, as we saw in the prior video, so my project is set up correctly. For stock footage, I typically do not need audio tracks. So what I can do right off the bat is I can right click on that track handle and simply delete that track because all we care about is the actual visual footage. And what I've done right now is, is I've just clicked and dragged. So I put click my mouse, hold down the left mouse button and drag. And now I've just selected a range and it shows that it's uh, 14 seconds and 27 frames is that correct no that's the end marker right here the actual length of this clip is right down here in the bottom right hand corner and it shows selection length so in essence what i've done now is, is i've selected a range that's 10 seconds and 27 frames long and let's assume that that is exactly what i want as my piece of footage so to render this, I need to render it out to a template or a codec, a compression decompression algorithm that the agencies will accept. And this is where it gets really fun. I am going to click on tools and I am going to simply click on render to new track and see what I've got. And this takes a couple seconds because it's gonna load all the codec information. And as you saw, it was basically grabbing all the possible codecs on my system that it knows or sees and this is important to understand it will grab the codecs that the sony vegas pro product knows or can see according to the windows standards and this is where it gets a little bit hairy all right first of all let's talk about where we're going to put this data or where we are going to render to. And if you remember in the ebook, I talk about file structures and all that kind of stuff. So I personally always have a working directory that I call stock raw. And as you can see, I have a bunch of different, different uh, directories with some sort of a description and what they are. And if it's a numerical value, it just basically means that's the date I shot the stuff. And that's also the date that organizes it in my directory. So I know this is going to be 2012. This was 04, 05. Here, I have a simple directory that I created that has absolutely nothing to do with stock footage per se for this purpose. I created this so that we'd have a little footage to play with. And basically, if I was going to save out footage, this is where I tell it that I'm going to save out footage to. So by selecting any one of these directories or creating a new directory, whatever have you, this is going to sell or, or tell Sony where it's going to write or render out the final pieces. I'm not ready to do that yet because as you notice, the save as type is totally incorrect. Before I can render out or select where I'm going to save the output file to, I first of all have to know what am I going to render it as? And this is determined by your agency. Your agency will have specifications that say what they accept and what they won't accept. And that has to do specifically with this topic right here. What format or what codec will they accept? in order for you to be able to upload and sell your stock footage. I can tell you right off the bat, predominantly most agencies accept QuickTime. And QuickTime has quite a few different codecs underneath it. QuickTime, I call it the wrapper, but it has a slew of codecs. Now when you first get Sony Vegas, you're going to have from here to here, and that's it. They're going to give you about six different little codecs and they're assuming that what you want to do is just go to the web 
and this is all compression for CD-ROMs and for internet and so on and so forth. Not good. We need more than that. And you'll notice I've created quite a few more over the years. And these codecs here are kind of important to understand because this is the heart and soul of your footage. And if this is not correct, you are not going to have exceptions through the curation process at your footage agencies. Your footage will basically be rejected. And it could be just because of simply having the wrong codec. So let's go and build ourselves a new codec because as I said, if you're new to Vegas, you're only going to have these six, seven codecs here. Let's see, it's six, six codecs to start. So I'm just gonna grab one and I'm just gonna go and, and click on Customize Template. And so here we have all the information that we need to fill out. And obviously, this is not going to be correct. So very, very first thing is the frame size. We know it's going to be high definition, so we need to change that to 1920 by 1080. That's your standard high definition frame size. The frame rate is going to be NTSC 29.97. This is for the US and Canada. If you're in Europe, you're gonna select PAL. If you're doing work for a film, you might go 24 frames per second for the film frame rate. But let's just focus on NTSC. At least you know that these frame rates can be changed. Typically, more and more so, agencies are asking for progressive footage, which means if you imagine a strip of film, there is a frame after frame after frame. And these frames are complete. They're like photographs. And that would basically be the definition of progressive footage. You have one complete photograph after another on this film strip that plays through. The alternative to that is, all, is, is basically interlaced, which is not what you want today, although it's still accepted by some agencies. And interlaced will either show or designate upper field first or lower field first. And that's going to depend on the camera that you use. It's going to depend on the standard that you're following, etc. If you see the field order showing anything other than progressive, then it will crank out interlaced footage, which is not what you want. Because if you're bringing in progressive footage, the last thing you want to do is interlace that footage. And interlace comes from the old television days where they used to send basically 60 frames a second and they weren't really full frames they were half frames and then your television and the signaling would merge those two frames and make it look like one complete picture and it had to do with how the television scanned and etc etc and this was all just technology and we've evolved now and we're into the digital age where you can send full frame progressive shots through your cable television or your digital satellite so keep that in mind progressive is predominant but don't discount the fact that interlace may still be around. Then we have the pixel aspect ratio. This always should be one. There are some exceptions, but I'm not gonna get into those right now um, because we wanna just keep it as simple as possible. So let's stick with one. That means a square pixel, basically, as opposed to a rectangular pixel or a crunched vertical rectangular pixel. Video format. Now this is where it gets interesting. This is the actual codec itself. What codec do we want to use? And what's really interesting here is we have a variety. But as you'll notice, in the Sony Vegas product, we do not have an H.264. H.264 is a proprietary codec from Apple and my guess is that at this point Sony has yet to come to a licensing agreement with Apple for integrating that codec into their uh, nonlinear editing system. So forget about H.264. If that's a requirement for your agency, Sony Vegas Pro will not be able to help you. But most agencies also accept Photo JPEG 
or a PNG file sequence. So let's have a look at these two. Here's photo JPEG, and if I go to configure, it gives an option to optimize for streaming, which we don't care about because we're not going to be streaming this. Streaming is such as pushing video through the internet, such as YouTube or Vimeo, things of that sort. So we don't even need to bother with that. The compressed depth, that's an interesting topic. You'll notice that this has eight bits per pixel or 24 bits per pixel. And what that means is obviously grayscale is a dead giveaway. That's gonna be black and white. So you're gonna have uh, eight bits of gray or shading of grays. So that would create a black and white output or a grayscale output. 24 bits, well, if we have eight bits times three, so eight bits for red, eight bits for blue, eight bits for green, then that would be 24 bits. And 24 bits per pixel means that we're men melding red, green, and blue, which is really great. That's really awesome because that's what gives you the full color. If I go and select PNG, I get some more options. I actually can go up to 32 bits. Now, yes, I can go down to grayscales and, and have limited and, and so on and so forth, but you will never work in these arenas here unless you're doing some special project or a commercial or something where you need some special effects. But here's an interesting one, 32 bits per pixel. And what that is, is you got your red, green, and blue, and then there's this fourth channel called the alpha channel. And that is covered in the ebook intensively. That is basically if you're going to do chroma key or green screen, blue screen type of work where you have transparency. That's for alpha transparency. So keep that in mind. PNG will allow you to do that. There's really nothing to configure other than select best, interlace, definitely not. You don't want to interlace PNG. All right, so now we come to the quality, and this has to do with the quality of output. How much data are we going to push out per frame? And there's a simple rule of thumb in typical stock footage of today. And this is not because, gee, we just decided to go at these percentages, but this has to do with the actual, uh, what we call HSL levels of the footage, your hue, saturation, and luma. And those are three numbers that you'll see commonly. You'll see, uh, for example, people in the Apple world will talk about ProRes 422. And then there's people in the professional world that talk about cameras that shoot at 444. Or your typical camera that you have or may have, which could be a Sony cam or a Canon camcorder or your Canon 7D, 5D, or even your T2i and T3i's, those shoot at 420. What that means is we have four factors of hue, two factors of saturation, and zero factors of luma. In other words, those are play areas that you can adjust and make adjustments. Or basically, how much data is it bringing in for each of these categories? And this gets a little bit confusing, but I'm trying to simplify this to apples and oranges just so that you understand. Obviously, the higher the numbers, if you have a 444, you have data to work with, and the pros love that stuff. If you're shooting at 420, which is very common on most cameras today, you can bring some of that data back. You need to use third-party products such as uh, Cineform, Neocene, which brings a 420 up to a 422. How do they do that? Well, if I could tell you, I'd have to kill you because it's all proprietary. They use some really super duper algorithms to do that kind of stuff. But we don't care about that. What we care about is, is how does that apply to this quality setting? The quality for a typical 420 file should never go beyond 87%. Because if you do, all you're doing is creating bigger files with not any more data. They're just bigger files. They just fatten up. 
it actually just creates placeholders. So if you had that data, that would actually be filled in, but not, not necessary. So for any type of footage that you're gonna be working on, go from anywhere from 82 to say 87, okay? If you are using 422 footage, you might wanna boost it up to even 92 or 93, but that's about your peak. So keep in mind, check your camera specifications, find out what it shoots in, and go from there. In any case, I'm not doing transparency, so I am just going to select Photo JPEG 24-bit. I'm gonna go at 84%, let's just leave it at that. So now, I have this new setting. I have a custom frame size. And actually, I could just select it right here instead of typing it in. And now I just need to name my codec and I'm going to call it agency HDP for progressive. And I'm just keeping the name short for demo purposes here. I could type in a full long description, which I'm going to show you for notes. I can put in and type in for my own self so that next time I pick up and look at this, I remember what it is very quickly. I could say no audio HD NTSC whatever you want to define speaking of audio let's go turn that off because remember we're doing stock footage we're not doing a full major motion picture so I don't care about the audio track and since I deleted it anyways who cares so now we can go back double check everything looks good now, what do I want to do? I want to save this so that I can use it again. So I click on save, which is this little diskette icon over here, and we're good to go. So now we have a new setup codec that we can use to actually render footage for the stock agencies. And that's as easy as it gets, or as hard as it gets. I really can't emphasize enough understanding and learning about codecs, because if you don't put it out correctly, your agencies are gonna reject. Now you'll notice that I actually have some other codecs here that are very close. So I'm just gonna go and customize that and just show you this is pretty much the exact same codec. All right. And now I can go and pick my file name because I actually have the correct codec selected. And now I can go to my directory and I can click on whatever I want. I'm going to save it out and keep it organized because I have stuff that I want to keep organized because in five years from now I may need to go find it again. And so I can call this renders or I can name it by the agency. As you see here, I've named one for the agency Pond 5. I could now call this one maybe Oh, I don't know. Mm, Clip Canvas, a European agency that I happen to work with. The key is keeping everything organized so that you can easily find them when it comes time to uploading. And now I just give the file a name. First, we'll go into that folder and we'll say, hey, Clip One, or whatever you want to name it. Now, that's if you do one at a, one, one at a time. And go. So in any case, so now I'm rendering. So I want to point out that this is how you do a single possible clip. But there are some dirty tricks on how to do a batch of these, a ton of these in one shot, where you don't even have to sit there and watch like we are doing now. Like, this is boring. We could sit here for 27 more seconds and watch this render. In any case, that's it for this tutorial. Stay tuned for more on rendering. Thanks for watching.